For our text this morning, we want to read from Matthew, the fourth chapter, 16th verse. But the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. I believe within every human being, there is a nature to search for a being that's greater than themselves. I think history proves that out. God early and clearly commanded the descendants of Abraham not to have other gods besides him. We read in Exodus, the 30th chapter and third verse. And this strict undivided loyalty that God commanded was the basis of the covenant relationship that God established between himself and his people. Sadly, the whole biblical history is punctuated by the numerous times the people of God turned away from him to engage in the worship of a strange god or goddesses People in the land surrounding Israel had deities that continually tempted the Israelites to turn from their own God. <clears throat> the land surrounding Israel, as is for us today, is, is a metaphorical reference to the world that surrounds God's people, that we're surrounded with on a daily basis, tempting and enticing Christians to turn from God and worship idols. These idols may not be as the ancients, a figure of stone or gold or uh, whatever it might be that they worship, but nonetheless, something that affects our worship. It affects our devotion to God. It affects our service to God. There's a positive and a negative to almost everything. And we understand what that is. When you, when you think about a magnet, the positive and negative uh, features of a magnet and how the positive and negative attract in nature. But in the world, the positive and negative polarities may attract. However, this is not true with God. God created man with the positive and the good nature in mind. He created us in his image. God created man with the good being the default characteristic and the characteristic that he desired for us to have. We know this because God created man in his own image. We're reading Genesis, the first chapter, the 27th through the 30th verse. However, sin entered the world through man and death came with it. Romans 5 and 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through man and death through sin, so also death was passed on to all men because of sin. In just one generation, sin and death was visited on God's creation through Cain, the firstborn of of Adam and Eve. And we know through the scriptures that, that Cain murdered his brother. But I'd like for you to notice in Genesis, the fourth chapter and the sixth through the 16th verses, but especially in the sixth and seventh verse, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why do you look so resentful? If you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do the right thing, sin will be waiting at the door ready to strike. It will entice you, but you must rule over it. God asked Cain, and this is putting it in my, my own words, why did you have such an emotional response? Why are you so angry? Why are you so resentful? If you had done what I had asked you to do, all would be well with you. But when you don't do what I ask, what God asks, Sin will take advantage. God gave Cain a, what I consider to be a very compassionate response to his anger and gave him a, a way out. He gave him the solution to his anger. But have you ever asked yourself, and I hadn't really, quite frankly, thought about this too much, but have you ever asked yourself, where did the emotions that Cain was exhibiting, was feeling, where did they come from? Well, man, we realize, and the scriptures bear truth to, that we were created in God's image. Man was created in God's image. So the emotions that we have come from God. Now, we realize that the emotions that, that Cain exhibited, the emotions that led to the murder of his, of his brother, is not the emotions that we're talking about with God. But God has emotions. Some theologians argue that God is not susceptible to emotions. He is not able to suffer or experience emotion. 
They subscribe to the doctrine of impassibility, which prescribes that God does not experience pain or pleasure from the actions of another being. We realize that the pleasures that we experience here in this world, are, we're not referring to those types of pleasures that God experiences. But God does experience pleasure when it comes to the obedience of Christians and when people, his, his children, follow His Word. Others believe God is passable, in other words, capable of feeling or suffering. I think the Old Testament has many references. It has many references of God's emotions. We're not going to go through all of these passages, but if you want to jot some of those down, these are all examples of God's emotions that we read of in the Scriptures. God's uh, the emotion of anger, compassion, grief, love, hate, jealousy, and joy. But we also realize that the emotions that we're talking about here, especially when you talk about hate, when we think about hate in our environment today, it's a very ugly thing because man has turned it into something that's very ugly. They turned it into something that is less, certainly less than desirable. When you hate a, a, your brother or you hate some other, other group or whoever that might be. And typically the hate that man has perverted, it turns into to violence as well. But the fact that humans have emotions is, I think, is one proof that God has emotions for He created us in His image. Another example is Jesus Christ. Jesus was not emotionless. He felt what we feel. Weeping for those who wept, John 11 and 35. Feeling compassion for the multitudes in Mark 6 and 34. And being overcome with sorrow, Matthew 26 and 38. But through it all, He revealed the Father to us in John 14 and 9. We recognize that the demonstration of emotions does not alter the immutability or permanence of God's will or His promises. Regardless of those emotions, God's will, His, His Word stays constant. God stays constant in His character and who God is. The uh, immutability of God is an attitude that God is unchanging in His character, will, and covenant promises. And I think this is clearly taught throughout the Scriptures. In Malachi 3 and 6, God affirms, I the Lord do not change. Also in Numbers 23 and 19, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. As he said, and he will not, he not do it. Or has he spoken and will not fulfill it? Isaiah 46, 9 and 11. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Now, this is not to say that the emotions that, uh, that we have, our emotions, are those of God are exactly the same. And they're not. Our emotions may become perverted, and many times they do. We sometimes speak of our emotions clouding our judgment. And I think this is especially true when we, true when we talk about love. Love has been... The very word love has been perverted. But many take that emotion of love and they pervert it in a way that, that sometimes it's not understandable for other people. They can't understand how this individual might love that particular person or, or how they exhibit that love. There's a vast difference between human anger and divine anger. Cain's anger, anger as an example, which ultimately resulted in the murder of his brother, was, was, it was violent. It was subjective and it was out of control. Proverbs 15 and 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Also in James 1 and 20, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
we understand through many examples of of what how God feels toward anger that the anger that man has perverted and the, the way that we exhibit anger is not something that God uh, opposed to. You know, we may be angry at ourselves because of something that we did. We may be angered because of the way that someone has been treated. And there's many different examples of that, but the way that we exhibit that anger is what makes it bad. Is what makes it is what these scriptures are talking about. Because many times we can't control that anger. Once we become angry, then the tongue becomes a part of that anger. We say things. We may not strike someone, but physically strike them, but many times we strike them with words. Words can be even more damaging. They can even cut even deeper than a bruise that a physical, uh, physically assaulting someone may cause. We certainly don't want to physically assault someone, but many times we don't realize the damage that we can cause with our tongue. I heard someone say the other day that once you say something, you can't get it back. One of our one of our leaders was having a meeting, and you know I was sitting there thinking, you know this this is not really a revelation that what you're telling us, but her leaders were had been talking that whenever they have something that comes before them that may upset them then they need to step back and take a little bit of time before they respond. It's human nature to respond immediately to something. Nine times out of 10, when we do that, and we do it out of, of anger or we let our emotions drive how we're going to respond, it's not going to be the, the correct. We're going to say something that we regret. We're going to say something that we can't take back. Even though somebody may forgive us for what we said, they still have that conscious image. They either remember those things that we said. They're, our tongues can be very hurtful. Our anger can be very hurtful and, and destroy people. God's anger is rooted in divine, in divine justice. God's anger is perfectly righteous. All God's emotions are rooted in His holy nature and always expressed <clears throat> sinlessly. God's compassion, His sorrow and joy are all perfected perfect expressions of his perfect being. Jesus' anger at the synagogue leaders in Mark 3 and 5 and his love for the rich young ruler in Mark 10 and 21 were perfectly motivated responses of his divine nature. Cain responded to God's reje rejection of his sacrifice with corrupt human emotions that led to sin. God basically told Cain, Asking him, as we mentioned a moment ago, why are you so upset? All you have to do is to do what is right and you will be accepted. That same is true for us today. All we have to do is what's right in the eyes of God. All we have to do is follow the scriptures. All we have to do is follow his commandments and we will be right with God. And we keep in check our emotions the way that God has intended us to keep them in check so that we... Uh, interact with our brothers and sisters in Christ and our peers and, and our neighbors and our, hus our wives and our husbands and children in a godly and Christian manner. Cain was upset with God because he criticized him. And what did he do? He lashed out at his brother. He didn't only lash out at his brother, but he slew his brother. When God, God calls out our sin, sometimes our response is to lash out at the person delivering the message rather than the source of the sin, which is internal. Cain did not channel his emotions as he should. We all have been in, put in situations before where we wish that we had handled it differently. We allow our emotion, our emotional response to get out of control. It's, it's not that we may not become angry. It's how we handle that anger. God's wrath and anger that was kindled was against sin. Cain's anger caused sin. The example of how God dealt with Cain demonstrates his compassion for sinners and his patience with us. God realizes that we're not going to be perfect beings, that we're going to make mistakes. We're going to do things that are contrary to his will. 
because we have choice. We have the ability to make those decisions to do things that we shouldn't do. Some of those are auto responses, I guess you'd call them. I don't know what a technical term would be, but we automatically respond in certain way to certain stimulus. You know, if somebody attacks us verbally, the tendency is that we're going to attack them verbally. When somebody attacks our family, then it's human nature that we're going to protect our family and we're going to address that issue. But we have to keep in check our emotions, brothers and sisters. We have to keep in check our emotions and be conscious about how we respond to those types of stimulations. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, ninth verse, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, that all should reach repentance. God is, he is slow. Not slow as we think about slow, but he gives us time many times to make the corrections that we need to make when we make, uh, when we make error. He gave Cain the opportunity to make correction, but Cain chose not to. God's anger, as we mentioned before, is rooted in divine justice. And God's anger is, is always perfectly righteous. God gave us emotions that we might fully experience life. God didn't create man to robotically follow him as we understand. He didn't create uh, spiritual zombies that just fall in line and follow him. He gave us the ability to choose who we follow. He gave us the ability to respond to his word. He gave that to his creation so that we might fully experience life. Why would God give man some of the emotions that we perceive as negative emotions, such as anger, hate, and jealousy? Some of the examples that we gave a moment ago. But if you look at how God experienced those emotions, you begin to understand the difference between how God applied those emotions and how versus how man applies those emotions. In Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. To me, the scripture is saying that I understand you're going to be angry at times, but be cautious with that anger because just as Cain did with his anger and his resentment and his attitude, he allowed Satan, he allowed sin to enter his life. And we see what that caused. James 1 and 20 says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. <clears throat> so even though that God gave us emotions, he expects us to keep those emotions in check and use them wisely. Emotions help us to feel life, but they also help us to feel God working within our life. God in the flesh through Jesus Christ felt emotions through the perspective of the human experience. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God descended like a dove and rested on him. And he proclaimed to all that heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I found it interesting that God didn't mention baptism. He didn't mention, and don't take me wrong. We know that baptiz baptism is essential. But the point that I want to make here is that God wanted to let people know that Jesus was his son and he was very proud of him. God wanted the listeners to know that this is my son whom I'm proud of. I admonish you fathers and mothers, don't be afraid to show your children positive emotion. Tell them, <clears throat> tell them how proud you are of them. They don't have to have won the game. They don't have to have hit the home run. They don't have to have made that final shot at the buzzer. They don't have to have made straight A's or excel at something that no other child has excelled at. All those things are, they may be important, 
all great things that need to be recognized maybe, but stop and tell your children that how much, how proud you are of them, especially when they obey what you told them to do. When they obey your, your correction or they obey your instruction, tell them how proud you are of them. Tell them how proud, <clears throat> how, <clears throat> excuse me, how proud you are of them just because they're your child. The emotional response to who they are and how much that they mean to you is important for their growth. It was important that God told His Son that He was proud of Him. He was proud because He obeyed Him. But He was also proud of Him because He was just His Son. <clears throat> You know, it is human nature that awakens the negative and sinful side of our, of our existence, of our life. The answer to the call to be a Christian, to place ourselves in the state that God intended us to be from creation. I consider it to be an awakening. It's an emotional awakening. You may be one who has never obeyed the gospel this morning. You may be one who has answered that call and for whatever reason you've fallen away. You may be someone who needs a boost in their Christian life. But regardless of your state, when you are moved or awakened to the reality that you must, um, by necessity, change your life, that you are touched by the consistent and ever, not, never changing laws in the, the Word of God, those changes that, that you must make to put you in an acceptable relationship with God. That realization is an awakening, brothers and sisters. It's a humbling and it's a gratifying experience. And I'm sure that most of you that can, can recall when you, were, when you were baptized, that feeling that you had. And I pray and I, I wish that we could all carry that feeling throughout our life when, we, when we're baptized because it's a... It's an experience that you can't, you can't really describe until you've experienced it. When you've had your sins washed away and you become in a personal relationship with God, it's an experience, it's an emotional experience that it's hard to explain to someone that hasn't, it hasn't happened to. The renewing of one's relationship with God is uplifting and it's gratifying. You know, Jesus, He felt grief he felt sorrow he felt compassion and he, he felt love and he felt anger toward the religious leaders of that time but he kept those emotions in check <clears throat> but you know as as much as we talk about the the highs of, of being a christian being a christian we all know that we have peaks and valleys we have valleys in our life when it may be because of a, a, a loved one that we've lost. It may be because of a personal experience that we've had. It may be because you add the, the rest of that sentence. Because many times those valleys are unique to each and every one of us. But when we enter those valleys, what makes the difference is, is how we respond. Peter's most trying time was not when he was persecuted and beaten because he counted those things as joy. He counted those as joy to be able to serve his, his, his Lord. Who but a Christian bound for heaven can say that they find joy in persecution and pain and suffering and in grief? Who but a Christian can say those things? His most trying time for Peter was his denial of his beloved friend and Savior. At the time Jesus needed him most, his his emotional response to those questions that were being asked of him. If he knew that man, if he was a part of that, that band that Jesus, that followed Jesus, his emotional response was that he was, that he denied Jesus. But after we know, after the cock crowed the third time, Peter realized what he had done and he went out and he wept bitterly. 
You know, I can only imagine the personal agony that Peter felt at that time. But it was certainly an awakening for him because he, he took that experience that he had in his life and he turned it around. He turned it around to become one, one of the greater apostles, apostles that, that were. But I'm also sure if we could ask Paul what was one thing in his life that had the greatest impact, the answer would be the, his conversion. This was an awakening to the plan God had for Paul's life. He spent much of his life, as we know, persecuting God's people, and he felt justified in doing so. He felt righteous in doing so. However, when God called his name, his, his true purpose of being on this earth was revealed. The Bible doesn't reveal why Saul was struck blind on the road to Damascus. Perhaps it was to humble him or to give him true time to reflect on what he had done in the past and to truly repent of what he had done and to really contemplate what was in store for him in the future. Perhaps it is symbolic of his living in darkness and his sight is restored. He, when his sight was restored, he is now living in the light. Paul indeed had an awakening. Many times our awakening may not be that pronounced, obviously. But nonetheless, whenever we obey God's word, when we let God touch our heart and we let Him, His word guide us to the repentance that we should have as, as, uh, as individuals, it's something that is an emotional thing. You know, when people come up and they are, uh, they become many times very emotional, and rightly so. Because it's an, a human experience that whenever you have to ask for forgiveness, or whenever you have to acknowledge that, that you are in a sinful state, it's a very emotional thing for each individual. question I asked this morning, can we separate emotion from worship? I don't believe that we can. And I want to explain that. I'm not talking about the ranting and ravings and jumping around and uh, the, all of the many things that some religions do that calls attention to self and detracts from God. I'm not talking about the, the wailing and to the breaking in, uh, into tears and things of that nature. But I also want to say it's okay if you cry. It's okay if you cry because you're touched by the gospel. But we're not talking about emotionalism this morning that determines whether something is good or bad based on an emotion. God's word never changes. Our emotion, whether we think that it makes us feel good or we don't make it think it makes us feel good, doesn't change the Word of God and what we're expected of us one iota. We're not talking about gauging doctrine on how it makes us feel. I simply mean that the gospel should have an impact on how we feel during worship. When we read God's, uh, God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, we should feel horror. When the Good Shepherd left the 99 to find the one that we should feel overcome with thankfulness. When we read the wonder of of heaven to come, we should feel thrilled. This morning, if when I worship, I should feel joy and gratitude and that we are the children of the Most High. I should feel sadness, grief, and sorrow, and shame and that Jesus Christ had to intercede on my behalf. He took the stripes from me, He shed His blood for me, and He died for me. I should feel uplifted through the songs that we sing and the praise that we give unto God. I should feel edified through the teaching of the Word, regardless of who stands before us. I should feel compassion for those who are suffering. I should feel compassion and a longing to touch those who are, uh, who are sin sick. I should feel remorse for the sin that I may have in life and in my life and the thanksgiving when we are saved from it. But brothers and sisters, we should feel when we are in service to God. All of these emotions are internal to each one of us. Emotion is often looked at as a weakness in our society. We try to 
many times try to ball it up and compartmentalize it. But the scriptures tell us in Matthew 5 and 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. And I ask you, how can we let our light shine if we are an emotionless human being? If God's light is not shining through us, if we are not exhibiting the hope that we have, then how can we expect to entice someone to God? And our response to being a Christian is motionless. How can others see Jesus through us? The Christian experience is full of emotions. And when we allow Christ to govern our hearts, minds, and emotions, we experience an enlightenment of allowing God's grace to purge us and motivate us to serve Him. But too often we allow our emotions or our feelings to dictate our Christianity in a negative way. Brother or sister so-and-so didn't speak to me this morning, so, you know, as the old saying goes, I get my nose bent out of shape. Or there may be other things that happen that or really, when you look at it in the scheme of things, a lot, of, a lot of times it's trivial. We allow those to affect the very thing that will take us to heaven. That's our Christianity and our faith. We rebel against circumstances around us that bowls over into our Christian life. Certainly the gospel message should stir positive emotions within us. But we sometimes rebel against the very message that was designed to save us. Cain rebelled against God's rejection of his sacrifice and he lashed out at his brother. How do we keep our emotions under control, you may ask? I contend by walking in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 24. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and they, these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revel revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will inherit, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Brothers and sisters, I leave you with this, with this thought this morning. May we always have these, these things. Enough happiness to keep us sweet. Enough sorrow to keep us human. Enough faith to give us courage. Enough wealth to meet our needs. Enough trials to keep us strong. Enough failure to keep us humble. Enough friends to give us comfort. Enough determination to live each day for Christ. The lesson is yours this morning, brothers and sisters. And I hope that it has stirred within you the understanding that emotions are something that are natural. Emotions are something that God gave us. But keeping those emotions in check is of the utmost importance. I really like the concept that God gave us emotions so that we could experience life, knowing that this life is only a preparation for the life beyond. But with any well laid, well laid plan, how we prepare for that next phase of our life, that next journey of our life is of the utmost importance. Time is of essence, brothers and sisters. Time is something that is fleeting, as we all know. And we want to give you the opportunity, 
if there is corrections that you need to make in your life, or if there's somebody that would like to become a child of God and begin that glorious journey of a child of God while we stand and sing. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead, do it. Like right now, click on it.